Hey guys, 2021 is closing and here are my suggestions for the Age of Empires 4 balance patch that we can be expecting in the year of 2022. This website is a, a cool tech tree that someone made and you can access it by going to my Twitch channel and typing exclamation mark tech tree. It's kind of like the in-game tech tree, but it has a little bit more info. If you click on a sieve and then you click on a unit, you can actually see their stats their HP, their movement speed, attack, and so on and so forth. Whereas in game, that isn't shown yet. So I'll be using this as I go through the eight civilizations and talk in general about what I think would be nice in the patch. This is not gonna be a super comprehensive list where I make sure that I don't forget a single thing. After all, I am not a developer for Relic or Age of Empires 4 myself. Um, nor does every single change that I talk about, nor do they have to be like implemented simultaneously if some of these ideas were used. Sometimes I may provide various different solutions to the same problem, and therefore uh, not all would have to be implemented at the same time as it would be too much. I'm also going to be following what the devs said is their philosophy for patching, where they said they'd rather buff weak things than to nerf strong things, as they think that is a more compelling and fun experience for viewers and players uh, to play the game. So rather than nerfing everything, I'll be buffing those that need it. As a general overview, I'm just gonna share with you what I think are the strongest civilizations right now. You can also check out exclamation mark tier list in my Twitch chat. You'll see my latest view on who are the strongest civilizations and why, and who are the weakest and why. You can also go to my Twitch chat and type exclamation mark landmarks. The Viper and I go over some landmark ideas uh, about which ones are weak and strong, and that's gonna go a little bit more in depth as well about what how some of them could be buffed, for instance. But without further ado, let's just start talking about which civs are strong and which ones are weak right now. There is a overview of user compiled stats that look at the latter at lower and middle and average and high elo. Turns out Mongols are the best, shocker. Uh, Rus follow them after that. At high elo, Delhi is actually third, but that's all probably because of one or two guys. <laughs> uh, Rus and Mongols are the best. Uh, the worst is Abbasid Dynasty, who have a sub 50% win rate against everyone. Mongols have an over 50% win rate against everyone. Uh, Rus has a lower than 50% win rate into English, longbows into Chinese, Choganu and defense, uh, and into uh, Mongols because of Tower Rush. And then everyone else is kind of in the middle of the pack. English, Holy Roman and French are kind of in the middle together with Delhi. None of these are particularly problematic. Holy Roman, Delhi, French and English. There are some map imbalances as well, with Mongols being even more overpowered on water hybrid maps. And something like English being worse, of course, on full water map. That's kind of the status right now. So with these changes that I'm suggesting, I'm hoping to give a little bit of in inspiration for the devs and for the players where there could be some areas of attention. Let's jump into it. We'll start at the top left, Abbasid Dynasty. Abbasid Dynasty is specialized at spending less food while expanding to a second or third town center because of fresh foodstuffs in the house of wisdom uh, they can spend much less food on uh, villagers from the economic wing you can upgrade fresh foodstuffs and you spend 25 food per villager this is a strong opening for them and it allows them to pump army even as they are making villagers from one two or three town centers I think this is an interesting identity niche. They also get special upgrade for the Spearman with Phalanx, bonus range. And then in the House of Wisdom, here's the fresh food stuff. In the House of Wisdom, from the military wing, they get boot camp. This gives infantry 15% bonus health. That will actually stack with the university upgrade, which is Elite Army Tactics, also extra health. Looks like this is the old patch info. Now I believe it's 20%. One of these, the health, I believe. So with that, Spearman becomes a mega tank, as are men-at-arms, archers, crossbows, hand cannons. 
So they're really good at spamming barracks units. They don't really have special knight upgrades, but their barracks and archery range units are uh, very effective. I'm not going too deep yet into hybrid or water map. I don't think Abbasid Dynasty is very playable in water. Well, I'll just touch upon it in this manner. Uh, the docks are cheaper for Abbasid, which is cool. But the ships that they can make are lackluster. Bagla does 50 damage with their broadside ballista. Uh, which, which actually means that with all the buildings in this game having 50 ranged armor, they are doing 1 damage into enemy docks. So if you are an Abbasid Dynasty player on full water, let's say Archipelago or Warring Islands, and you go for, you, you start the game and you're making some Dao. Okay, Dao are fine. You have archer ships, enemy has archer ships. You get to Castle Age, you can now make explosive Dao, very similar to other explosive ships. But you can also make the Bagla. Other ships have hulks sometimes, or they can upgrade their arrow ships. Uh, well, Hawks have 100 damage, so they do 50 damage into buildings. But Bagla has 50, which you think like, oh, it's half. But they do 1 damage into buildings. So they're doing 2% of the damage that a Hulk does. Even though it seems that it's just half into buildings, because of the way armor works, that's how it is. So they're pretty weak. Both Delhi and Abbasid suffer from weak late game on water. Because of this, they pretty much don't get picked there. So I would suggest do something about buffing the Bagla. You can try to keep it unique, but it has to have something where if you do obtain water control, that you can take out your opponent's docks with the Bagla, which right now is not possible. So I'd say Abbasid could probably use a little buff on Bagla. Ideally, every Sif should be playable on a hybrid map and every Sif should be playable on a full water map. As much as some of the player base doesn't like water, I actually don't mind it. I think part of it is the lack of diversity and versatility in choosing your Sif on water. I think water can add a really interesting dimension to the game, and I think it's done better in AoE 4 than in many other games. I even like the Hulk spinny micro. It's better to have micro than just have it be boiled down to a number game. And with transport ships, there are some pretty cool plays. Though I will say water maps in general are harder to play because uh, of the many areas of attention, and I think that scares some of the player base as well. Shebek are... I don't have much experience with them, but they're not a PvP ship, they're PvE building. So Abbasid on water is weak. So my main first suggestion for Abbasid is to buff the Bagla. Many other things work well for Abbasid Dynasty. I also think that the landmarks work quite well. Culture, economic, military, and trade are all good uh, wings. And in the super late game, you can get all five. Essentially, you go to the fifth age, kind of like dynasties with Chinese. You get one extra that doesn't advance you in the age, but you get all of its benefits. For all of these upgrades, almost all are useful. Camel Rider Shields is weak, but that's because Camel Riders are weak. And Faith is weak, because monks will probably die before they cast a uh, conversion. All of these are good. Bootcamp, Grand Bazaar, Improved Processing. This is good, this is good, this is weak. This one is kind of weak, I guess, but <laughs> it's not expensive, I suppose. Good, 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 good. So I think this is a very well-designed landmark. I don't have much to remark on it. I've really been enjoying playing Abbasid recently. Besides the Bagla buff, I would say the Camel Rider needs a bit of love. The They are high cost. They are not a trash unit. They cost gold. They do bonus damage into cavalry. Uh, how much? They do like 10 damage and plus 20 against cavalry. So they're doing 30 damage with an attack speed 1. You look at the Lancer. 29 damage. Attack speed 138. So the Camel Rider does a DPS. He does 21 DPS, right? Camel Rider does 10 DPS. It's going to be 30 DPS. So the Camel Rider has like 35, 37% more damage into enemy cavalry than a knight. It costs 240. Lancer is also 240. A little bit different, different distribution of food versus gold. 
So you get the 37% more damage when you ca count its attack speed. But Camel Rider doesn't have a charge attack as far as I know. The Lancer does. Lancer will hit like with their charge attack for, I don't know, 40 or something. Then the health for Lancer is 270, Camel Rider is 320, it has a little bit more health. But then you look at the armor. The Lancer has an armor of 5 in Imperial, the Camel Rider is 0. <laughs> So that bonus health that it has, the fact that it costs a little bit more food, these are good things, but not having five armor is a bad thing. Now you can get three melee armor at the uh, House of Wisdom, but that is an extra investment. And the Lancer is good against everything. Villagers, men at arms, archer, crossbow, siege. Camel Rider can only kill enemy knights. It's a little weak. If it's going to be an anti-knight unit, give it plus 40 against cavalry, or plus 30. Can even make it a little bit more expensive, if need be. But at the moment, the unit misses the mark, because he has far too specific of a counter. If I want the aura for the enemy cavalry being afraid, I'd rather make a camel archer who somewhat stays at the back. Not enough, he's in front of archers. But at least he's somewhat in the back, and he doesn't instantly die, unlike the Camel Rider. For the rest, I don't have much to say. I think Abbasid is working pretty fine, uh, for the most part. They do have a low win rate. Which actually surprises me. I think it's probably going to get better, to be honest. I think it will get better. Um, some of that win rate has been recorded before, uh, before we got better at the Sif, I think. I don't really see an easy way to buff their win rate. I think there are a few areas that need nerfing in other sifts, despite the philosophy of the devs. So I would just go quite easy on Abbasid. Go with the Bagla and the Camel Rider and see how it goes. Abbasid are one of the most balanced sifts in my opinion. Now let's move on to Delhi. Delhi ha are some of the most bugged civilizations right now, sadly. They're still fun to play. They're still valid to play, but it is difficult to point at things that need buffing or nerfing without first knowing their true power post, uh, post bug fix. Their spears still do not have the ability in any way to brace to stop cavalry charges. And because of that, Delhi cannot make the very standard feudal unit composition of spearman archer and face off against a knight archer player. So Delhi tends to want to rush to castle, but they don't have the tools to survive feudal in uh, land maps oftentimes. They need to play fairly gimmicky, defensive, hope enemy don't pressure them too much. If you just go early nights into Delhi, they can't do much against it. But overall Delhi is actually quite a powerful faction. Since they changed the imperial and feudal timings, for research, the feudal and dark age research actually completes very quickly now. Things like wheelbarrow, uh, wheelbarrow, forestry, and then double broadaxe, horticulture, specialized pick. All of these together, you're always going to have them by 10 minutes into the game. That's very powerful. Other sifts don't get to enjoy that economy uh, advantage. They have other ones, but this is what Delhi has. And if Delhi can survive to the mid and late game, they get all of this as well, which is very powerful. They have the fastest moving religious units. And they're always going to have all the upgrades eventually. Textiles should be default for them as well. Then the water, same problem. They only have Bagla and Shebek. I would say the same thing for them. Bagla needs a little bit of buff, uh, probably. But it's less of a problem for Delhi, because while Baglar can't kill buildings, at least on hybrid map, Delhi is quite strong and Baglar could imbalance them. You also have elephants in the H3 that removes the need to go for rams to kill enemy docks or some such. But on full water map, I would still worry for Delhi to be effective. And maybe the Baglar could help there. Let's talk a little bit about the landmarks. Uh, Delhi gets the following landmarks. Tower of Victory, Dome of the Faith. Dome of the Faith is cheap scholar production. Tower of Victory 
needs a bit of a change. Again, my landmark video explains more about it. This should, uh, this is still bugged. It doesn't work as intended. But mostly I think they should uh, just do an influence area buff. Maybe melee and ranged infantry who, like, so long as your tower of victory is attached to the unit producing structure via the influence, just like how masks need to be attached, infantry that is produced anywhere on the map has 10% uh, bonus attack speed. That would be really cool and powerful. Maybe too powerful, it could be rebalanced. But right now it's tedious because you need to rally your units past the Tower of Victory's tiny range. Would be an interesting, strong feudal uh, alternative to Dome of the Faith. Then, I think both House of Learning and Compound of the Defender are valid and they are interesting alternatives. But the House of Learning upgrade Hone the Blades takes a little bit too long, 22 minutes, because it's considered Imperial, even though it comes out in the House of Learning. Lookout Towers also has some bugs, only applies to past towers, not future. Again, fix all the bugs, and then we'll see how strong some things really are. In terms of uh, Elephants and their normal units, I think Delhi is fine, they're quite strong actually. They have all the standard units, and then they have two kinds of elephants. And they're strong because they don't need many upgrades. Hisar Academy giving food, based on research. Uh, researched. Obviously, this would be stronger if you could choose which research came out of it. If it does work like this, and if it isn't bugged, then... Uh, it could be okay, I guess. Food is kind of the least precious resource, so I don't feel like this is a well-designed landmark with what we know about the game now. I, I would say this needs a buff. This one is also... Mm, it's okay. It's okay. This one's okay. Yeah, not much to say about Delhi. I think overall I like their vibe a lot right now. They need their spear fixed and maybe rework Tower of Victory a bit. For the rest... I'd like to see what they're capable of. I think if all bugs were fixed on Delhi, they might actually be number one civilization. So we might be talking about nerfs after the next patch. Talk about Chinese. For Chinese, I think they're working really well. There's two major things that I think Chinese need. One, a nerf on Fire Lancers. Our casual player base is important to all of us, to them and to us. And Fire Lancers are ruining team games. Part of the problem is there's two Sifts that cannot use Spears to brace against them, but they also just have a lot of torch damage. Like three times as much as others? I think it could be twice as much as others. And they would still be good. Their AoE charge attack also seems a little strong. That could probably be nerfed by 33% less charge damage. And I think they would still be good. This UN dynasty that you go to, the third age dynasty, already gives you many advantages. UN dynasty gives you bonus movement speed on every unit on the map. That is so good. And it only costs you the H3 twice. Additionally, you get access to the granary, which is a powerful building. You can stack these in a triangle and have a little farm village around it and you'll have infinite food. And then you get the Fire Lancer, who will be twice as good at raiding buildings as other units, is fast and has a charge AoE attack. I don't think it needs to be as good as it is. So I'd say nerf the Fire Lancer. Everything else works fine, unit-wise. I think Nest of Bees is an interesting unit that is a nice alternative to Mangonel. Bombard, Springled, all of this is fine. I will say this about the Clock Tower. I think this should be 30% extra health on Siege, not 50%. That should be nerfed. So, so far we have two nerfs. Is Chinese the best? Are they the weakest? Neither. Two nerfs would maybe hurt them. I have ideas for buff too. Great Wall Gatehouse is weak 
I think you can buff this a bit. It always just dies. <laughs> if you build it in attack, it just dies to Bombards. Not much to say about that. I don't know how to buff it. Imperial Palace is re uh, really strong, so that doesn't need any changes. Imperial Academy is weak. I would say... When you build Imperial Academy, any Imperial official that is currently carrying money should become 30% faster. That would be my description for Imperial Academy. No extra tax gold generation. That doesn't do anything. They're just gonna have lots of gold inside them all the time. No. Imperial officials with money in their pocket sprint to the next location. Whether you send them back to the TC or go get more gold somewhere else, or you're just putting money in their pocket to walk them across the map. That would be really interesting. Faster moving IO. And I want one more. And, and this would then be like uh, the same thing. Carry 40 instead of 20. Now they're walking faster. Now you're actually getting more gold. This does not get you more gold. Okay, and there's one more change I want to make to the Chinese. The max amount of Imperial officials. You can only have four. And here's the best way to use them, in my opinion. One is going to supervise your mining camp on the gold. If you've got eight villagers on gold, that Imperial official works like uh, two extra villagers, is it? Uh, eight, eight times 1.2. Yeah, almost two extra villagers. I guess since he costs three villagers worth of food, that doesn't seem fantastic, but he gets trained in the same amount of time as a villager. So you have the little food debt that you pay on him. And after that, he's worth some. I think generally how to use Imperial Officials is one is going to supervise your gold. If you have 10 plus villagers, it's better to have him supervise than to pick up gold, I think. Uh, also because you get more gold out of that mining camp. One is going to supervise your lumber camp that has 20, 30 villagers dropping off. And then one is going to supervise your early sheep and deer mill where you're going to get anywhere from 8 to 20 villagers dropping off food. That would really only leave you with one extra Imperial official to do anything. And he's going to have to decide between supervising your astronomical clock tower, supervising your uh, barracks, your blacksmith, university. There's a lot of th different things to supervise, to produce faster or research faster. There's really no one left to collect taxes. I don't think that you're going to put one Imperial official to collect taxes when he could instead be supervising your gold mining camp. So how about having five max Imperial official? I think you will actually have the ability to send one or two on super on uh, tax collection. So that could be a nice uh, buff to compensate some of the nerfs I talked about. French. French spears, men at arms, they're fine. Uh, French is strong on water. All their ships have a purpose. All their barracks units have a purpose. Our arbitrier are strong. Ar they have archers. They have hand cannoneers. It's really vanilla, just good stuff. Chamber of Commerce, School of Cavalry are all working fine. Their knights are strong. I will have a note on horsemen in general. Not just French horsemen, but horsemen in general. Recently we had a patch that gave them one ranged armor, but nerfed their health by like 30. I think you can add 5 or 10 health to all horsemen from every Civ. And then they'll actually be better against ranged units than before. Right now, they're the same against ranged units. And weaker against everything else. And I think they're one of the worst basic units in the game. Scouts are even better than them. Knights are better, Spears, Archer, they're all better than them. I think 5 or 10 health extra. Right now he has... This is not updated, I think. I think they have 125. Give them 5 or 10 extra health based on what they have now. French is quite well balanced uh, overall though. Going back to French. 
the landmarks, Royal Institute and Guildhall are both good. I think Guildhall is too good. I think it should have a max of uh, 3000 resources. It's it's really strong, but like if you don't collect, if you if you wait for a while, you can collect a thousand stone, build a keep. But if you don't collect, it can rack up to like 10k. It's pretty nutty. Of course, you may say, did you pressure the French player enough? They didn't need to click that button. But I think Guildhall is pretty nutty. French overall is well designed though. I think this should have a max. And when you reach the max, it just like uh, automatically adds it to your uh, coffers so that you don't miss out on potential if you forget to click it. Let's look at the final landmarks. Both of these are fine. Overall French is well de well developed and I think uh, they should be the golden standard of bringing others to their level. I really don't have much to remark on them. They're also really balanced. Holy Roman Empire. They have the Spearman bug. Spoken of about it. They'll be a lot better when they're allowed to make some spears and actually feel good about it. Men at arms, quite strong, but they're not the only playstyle. They can make knights. I'll say this about Landsknecht. I think they need something. I think the best thing for them actually would be movement speed. I've been thinking about this a lot. Attack damage, armor, cast, health. What should be done about them? I think movement speed makes them better at harassing villagers. And closing the gap into enemy archers and crossbows, which they're supposed to be good against, but they're not because of the health and the lack of armor. If you give them 5 to 10% extra movement speed, I think Landsknecht, even in their current form and cast, will find their place. Holy Roman on water is working fine. Galley are fine. Hulk are fine. There is, of course, the bug right now that uh, some demo ships have an insanely big explosion and that is a bit of an issue So I think that needs to be looked at. For the rest, demo ships work fine. Karak, Hulk are all okay as well. Uh, let's talk landmarks. I think that's the biggest thing. Minework Palace, right now I don't think it's good enough. Research from Blacksmith overall isn't that expensive and 25% less is not a big buff. If you, like some people suggest, give quicker research time for this i'm afraid holy roman is going to be like protoss where because of chrono boost they become the best uh cheesy rushes all the time i think that could be a problem um i don't i don't think like going mine work would be equivalent to never leaving feudal or castle and just rushing all in all the time which i don't think is that much fun you could make this cost 35% less, would be a little bit more compelling. Or maybe, <laughs> is this a stupid wish list? Maybe when you go Minework Palace, there's a post Imperial fourth upgrade. <laughs> would that be cool? You can get the fourth armor upgrade, the fourth attack, the fourth ranged attack upgrade. Uh. It's a bit weird. But yeah, I don't think mine work is uh, very strong right now. But maybe like if there's some unique upgrades, like if you go mine work palace, you unlock three unique upgrades. One for horseman, uh, plus one extra range armor or something. One for Landsknecht, plus 10% movement speed. Uh, and, and one for, uh, I don't know, like men at arms, plus one range. I don't know, like I'm not being super creative right now, but I think one or two unique or upgrades maybe all maybe all for the Landsknecht 
Even though they cannot be made in feudal, so... But yeah, if you get the castle, then it is unlocked. I think that could work. Or if you don't want to make anything special, it could just be 30% less. And let's see if it gets played. Especially after the prelate bug fix comes through. I think Aachen Chapel is going to feel a little bit more uh, underwhelming, actually. Since there's plenty of games where it doesn't even inspire 10 villagers for that long anymore uh, at some point. It's mostly an early game landmark. Uh, and then super late game, once you have 50 farms around it. Mm, yeah, all of this is quite fine. As a sift, generally they're quite fine. Then they get the landmark at H3. Burgrave Palace. There's something wrong with it. You cannot make three infantry out of it. You can't make four infantry out of it. I think Burgrave Palace would be much more useful if it simply cut down your infantry production time to 20%. <laughs> Build a men at arms in. How long do they normally train in? Does it say? 22 seconds? Build a men at arms in 5 seconds out of the Burgrave Palace. Make it work like uh, Elsbach Palace. It will be good then. Just being able to have a unit that fast, it does actually remind of Protoss as well then. Like with how fast you can warp in units. That would be strong. Sounds too strong maybe. Maybe not like this. Maybe build in one third of the time. Men at arms, seven seconds. Still very strong and it will be fun. 100% you would use it sometimes. If you see that the relic locations is bad, or you get the castle much slower than someone else, you go Burgrave, now you can make men at arms, 7 seconds, a pop, or spearman. Part of the reason this is weak right now is uh, because uh, you don't care about the spearman, so you're only making men at arms out of it. You also cannot use Burgrave for upgrades because you'd be wasting your time with those upgrades, since it has the capacity to train 5 men at arms, then why would you ever go for an upgrade here so it doesn't even fully replace the need to make barracks you would still need barracks to get research if you just make burgrave three times as fast at everything then you could also complete heavy maces in 20 seconds instead of 60 seconds now that would be good now you can go burgrave you can then get your upgrades real fast bada bing bada boom bada boom then start spamming men at arms from it this would be really good and it would be fun compared to Regnitz. All of this is fine. This is an interesting upgrade that I think we can definitely dive more into once spears aren't bugged anymore. I think you'll see it sometimes. And prelates need that bug fix. For the rest, they are fine. Uh, let's talk about inspired warriors. If this can apply to everything, right now it doesn't work on mangonels and a bunch of other things. If this can work on everything, or maybe mid-combat inspiration is allowed, which right now it's not, would be super cool to bring prelates into battle and inspire all your stuff. Something to look at. All of this is okay. Culverin in general probably need a bit of a design freedom space. As it stands, Springles with Roller Shutter have 12 range and shut down enemy siege. Culverin does the exact same thing. The old Springled was also good into units. Now that they nerfed it, appropriately and well done so. Springled can only be used in, into enemy siege for the most part. And Culverin are the same. So it's just a full overlap. The counterweight trebuchet and the Bombard also have overlap in that they are best into buildings. But Bombard also kills everything else. This is why trebuchet isn't so good. The only thing trebuchet has is bonus range. The only thing Culverin has is no setup time. But for the rest, Culverin is expensive slow, does nothing into units or buildings, only kills siege, and Springled is faster than it. No setup time, but it's faster. Uh, and it can kill villagers or archers. Culverin barely even does that. So it's really strange when you make a decision between Springled and Culverin, you're really like, you're not thinking which one is suitable for the task, you're thinking um, flip a coin or something, or which one is numerically better? And then you'll just get that one. It's just numerically better. Or this one is just numerically better. Then you get that. 
but the design overlap is 100%. So Culverin should have like 14 range if you want to make it an actual monster at killing enemy siege. That way it will outrange everything in the game uh, besides Trebuchet. If it has 14 range, then uh, it would legit just be better than Springhold and worth the Imperial tag. Um, Elsbach Palace is the cheapest H4 landmark and is worth 4 TC for the price of 1 TC. This may be the strongest landmark in the entire game. And they're part of the reason Holy Roman Empire is competitive despite their weak feudal... Uh, yeah, their weak feudal timing and their reliance on relics. With the new suggested Burgrave that I mentioned and fixed prelates and spears, I think Holy Roman can be competitive even in feudal and castle. That will remove the need for Palace of Swabia to catch up in villagers. Swabia is really fun to use, but it also makes it feel nearly meaningless for enemy to do raids to kill your villagers. And maybe that's not ideal. Maybe this should be three times the villager production, not four times. At seven, at uh, one third the cost, not one quarter the cost. You're already getting a cheaper age for landmark. And you're getting four TCs out of it at the price of one, which altogether is a lot of power. I think it can be nerfed a bit. Elsbach Palace probably should be in some way buffed a bit. Maybe it should finish with some emplacements inside of it already. I'm not 100% sure about it. It doesn't feel very strong, but I will admit that I might be wrong. Right now, no one in their right mind would go for this, so we're not getting a lot of good data about it because Swabia is generally the choice. If you make it to Imperial with 100 villagers already, there's probably still a good reason to go for Swabia, just for future villager replacement. But if you make it to Imperial with uh, 120 villagers, I don't know when you ever would, but let's say if you do, then Elsbach would be the right choice. And you can put a relic inside of it to make it even better. So not bad, I suppose. We'll definitely see some of this, even if nothing else changed. Overall, Holy Roman is for the most part okay with the points that I mentioned. Okay, Mongol. Mongol is a combination of various overpowered mechanics while adding some design weaknesses where you hope that their balance comes out in the middle. And if you look at our early tier list of all the content creators, we actually had them listed lower. It's because they were a little bit harder to understand at first. We now know that was naive. Mongols are by far the best. And you can never point at exactly why a sieve is the best because of one or two single things. It's always a combination of many different things. And of course, every sieve has their strengths and weaknesses. So it's senseless to point at all the strengths and say that's why they're overpowered. It's the exact numbers where the magic and the key lies. And we should not just look at what is strong because strong things are fun and good. Otherwise, why would you play a sieve? We should look at what is strong and lacks counterplay and that needed experience we needed a couple of months of playtime to find that out though we've known for a while now let's let's be fair so mongols have a few strengths they don't need to build any houses so they save wood they have the ovu for free stone production which uh, is like it's worth villagers and you have it all game long so you always have some bonus villagers from very early in the game the ovu builds in uh, 15 seconds you can make it at the start of the game. So essentially, you're starting with more villagers than any other player. Even the French, with their vaunted bonus villager production, doesn't have a new extra villager producing stone immediately when the Ovu is made. So Ovu, even just generating stone, it's strong. Then their outposts, just like other sieves, have stone cost to upgrade uh, towers. So while stone has many OVU applications, you can also upgrade all of the outposts on the map with it. I would say it would be better if Mongol outposts and placements only costed gold, not stone. Leave the stone for the unique bonus villager production and have outposts actually carry a cost in upgrading them. Not 25 gold, 50 stone. This can essentially in many games be read as 25 gold, nothing else. Since the stone is auto-generated, 
And to be fair, you do give up the opportunity cost of mass producing units, but pretty much if they tower rush you, or if they have towers on their trade route or anywhere, they're gonna go arrow slit, arrow slit, arrow slit, arrow slit, arrow slit, arrow slit, everywhere. Spring all the placement, spring all the placement, because it feels cheap or free to them since the stone came in for free, essentially. So Mongols have the cheap outpost, 70 wood instead of 100. They've got no house production needed, a free villager out of the Ovu. They get double unit production out of the Ovu. Uh, and then they have um, they have the Yam network, which is also given through the deer stones. Yam network is a bo bonus movement speed aura that with deer stone applies to everything that they do. So Mongols essentially get a four to seven minute yuan dynasty basically chinese need to be tier three and a half and mongols get it in tier two movement speed on everything but with the condition that you're near a deer stones and a yam uh, network or an outpost right even though that's ex extremely strong the real problem i think is that the yam network aura lingers for 30 seconds on any unit that has been in range of an outpost or deer stones within the last 30 seconds right so essentially that's almost anywhere on the map applying to everything and i think that is a bit too much i would venture have units be faster within range of the deer stones and the and the outpost but don't have Yam Network apply to things that leave its area. Just like Network of Castles for the English. This part feels too strong. Then they rely on the outpost, they need to stay near and they're fast there. But not, I left an outpost in the middle of the map and now I'm in your base and I'm still fast. That's weird. Mongol on water is fine, light junk, war junk are not the best. But they do get the Bauchan. Wow, they get Bauchan? Yeah, I would say Mongol and hybrid and water is uh, strong enough. So let's be concise. My suggestion is that Yam network only applies around an outpost. And Ovu, I think, right now, a spearman that costs 80 requires 80 stone to be double produced. I would venture make the stone 1.25 formula instead of times one so if a spearman costs 80 then the stone cost for the spearman should be 100 i think that would be a uh, good nerf to ovu double production because as it stands they're really good at all kinds of scout and spearman dark age rush and the double production at the cost of half is part of the problem there let's try that 1.25 stone multiplication instead of times one Either that or slower stone generation. Both would work. And I would suggest that emplacements cost gold only and not stone. So 75 gold instead of 25.50. Uh, step readout. 50 gold drop off. It's too much. I think it should be 40. Kudultai. Hmm. I think it's okay. It's a fun, aggressive landmark. Silver tree deer stones are both good. The white stupa is very good. Kaganet palace is uh, a weird one. I think it's too soon to write it off, perhaps. But this one and the Wingard palace and the Tower War elephant production, they all feel a little weird because I don't know, a lack of control or a lack of relevance sometimes. And it's like random what you're gonna get. Lancers being great, horsemen being meh. It's hard to say. Kaganet is weird. Um, I don't really know how to fix it. I don't think it's like the best design for how we understand how the game is to be played now. Overall, Yam network and outpost uh, problem. Oh yeah. And now something about Mongol Tower Rush in general. Yam network is part of the issue of the balance of Mongol Tower Rush. Ovo stone production for units is part of the problem for Mongol Tower Rush strength. Once you implement those two changes or three changes that I mentioned, I think it's going to help a bit already. Maybe a lot. 
And Mongols still find Sif without Tower Rush. It just gives them an edge every single game because of it, but they're actually quite good even without of it. There's one more thing I want to mention. I think outpost production in general for every Sif should have no armor. So when you make an outpost, if a villager, a spearman, uh, a town center, a defensive tower is attacking an outpost that is in construction, it should take either double or triple the damage it normally does, or it should not have the 50 ranged armor tag that it has right now during that. Because you can literally build an outpost in enemy town center range right now, and I've tested this, I've seen this, it will die 20 minutes later. If I build an outpost in your town center range and it starts taking fire and I build it with one villager, it will still be alive 15 minutes later if it doesn't get attacked by any units. So that is weird and feels like bad gameplay. Either town center need to get bonus damage into outposts or all defensive towers should get bonus damage into enemy towers that are still in construction because right now Mongol tower rush is too good. It takes too long to clear them up. They're too cheap. They get arrow slits too cheaply um, and it gets too cheaply defended with the spears that get double made. So something about outposts that are building are weaker. I think you get the point. Let's go on to the final two sifts. English. English longbows are an interesting unit. They are quite polarizing. They are strong, but they're a bit slower. And they cost 10 food more than normal archers. That is their unique niche. Let's let that remain so. They get armor chats for the minute arms. It's an interesting upgrade. On water, they're fine. They get the galley, the hawk, the karak. Uh, all of this is working quite okay, I think. Then they get the standard units. Arrow volley to add relevance to longbows in the late game. All of their keeps can produce units. All of their landmarks can be like a town center. I think most of them are all working fine. Network of castles has a bug. It doesn't apply evenly. But if it gets fixed, it'll be even better. They get some cool siege units. It's all fine. Wingard Palace is a bit weird. It is cost effective to make, but it's a weird motley army to, to use. I don't know how to balance it, and I have no suggestions for it right now. But uh, it is a bit weak, in my opinion. Or maybe it's strong. But then you'd rather have a big defensive building that... Uh, that has a big weapon range. You're generally rather going to want to have that. Now, the biggest thing I have to mention about the English is Abbey of Kings. If your game is 99% well designed, accept this as your greatest failure. There's no, and, and that's fine. You don't know how the game is going to be played. Necessarily, you don't know how people are going to use the game, how they're going to find all the build orders or the play styles. You cannot have your feudal landmark be a fallback point while giving up two archery ranges uh, in the council hall. And then you come back and you go heal very, very slowly with no units because you don't have council hall, so you don't have units. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work. It, I don't know how to fix it. I just think they need to completely redesign it, how it works. It could just be very simply... Council Hall is double archery range and Abbey of Kings is double barracks. <laughs> Boom. Two neutral choices that are both equally good. Maybe one will be better than the other. I don't know. But you could just choose barracks or archery range. That would be fun. Uh, yeah, for the rest, I think English, like the French, are fairly balanced. I don't really know that I want to point at anything that uh, could change. I think they are not weak. English do fine into Rus, which is a strong barometer of their strength. They are the least likely to be tower rushed by Mongols because their villagers have archer bows. Uh, yeah, I, I think English is balanced, actually. They're somewhere in the middle, maybe slightly below, maybe, maybe slightly below, but that's just because Rus and Mongol are overperforming so hard. So not much to say about them. Rus! The final Sif. 
Uh, Rus is a little problematic. Their meta has them never gathering gold and still getting more gold than other sifts. That feels a little weird. Part of the reason is hunting cabin gold generation. Part of the reason is golden gate that allows them to get to castle age very quickly and get relics before everyone else. Part of the reason is that their monks are on a horse and can therefore bring back relics so much faster. It's a huge difference. And then they get the bounty for the animals, which gives them extra gold. And then the warrior monks can go to the sacred sites. Overall, here are my suggestions for Rus. It's unique. They're on a cavalry. I think the warrior monk should be nerfed a bit. Either health. Maybe it's health. It's really hard to kill it, actually. Or it's speed. Have it be faster than other monks. If that's their unique design, then okay, I can accept that. But maybe not as fast as they are right now. Slowing them down would even help Rus in that they are not the first to charge into battle, but they come in after the feudal knights. Then hit them, they get the aura. They just won't be as good as they are at retrieving relics without any counterplay. I'd say maybe the warrior monk should be 10% slower. The high trade house is, I think, fine design. Abbey is a fine design. Uh, Kremlin... It's a little weak, but sometimes supposedly you want it into Mongols, perhaps. It is a little weak, though. It's an outpost. But it's still better than Barbican of the Sun, interestingly. It just shows how strong Golden Gate is. I think it's too soon to do something about Kremlin. What did I say so far? Warrior Monk slower? What else? Hmm... I think scouts generally need a nerf for all civilizations. Part of what makes Rus a little strong right now is how strong scouts are. My suggestion for scouts across the board for every civilization is to reduce their torch damage by probably 50%. So let what by that I mean is you take their current value and you do times 66%. I think they need to be weaker at torch damage. They're a bit too good at killing things. And I think they need a health nerf. All scouts across the whole game, uh, from Rus and others, should get a health nerf of 25% or something. You could also remove animation cancelling. I don't have a strong opinion on this. Some of the player base hates it. Personally, I kind of like it. It adds micro. Uh, in a game that already doesn't heavily emphasize on micro. So I like that. I'm a Warcraft 3 player. But I think health nerf and torch damage nerf are in place. Lodja attack ships. In my opinion, they should take 30 seconds to transform. I think all Rus ships should take 30 seconds to transform, not 20 seconds. And of course, nerf the uh, explosion Imperial uh, bug where two Lodja attack ships just blow up things that are like... I don't know, longbow range away. They blow up like a dock from halfway across the screen. Uh, that's more of a bug fix. Overall, Russ is performing quite well on water and on land. I think the 30 second transformation time instead of 20 would be appropriate. Then they have lots of strong cavalry upgrades. Then we get to the horse archer. I think among all units in the game, horse archer is the most powerful. Um, they are bugged in that they say there's an attack speed of one attack every two seconds, but actually they do one attack every one and a half seconds. They are cheap, 80 slash 40. They get loads of bonus range. I think it's two extra range or three. I don't know. It's a lot of extra range mounted precision. Um, we don't even go Strelsey because horse archers with all upgrades, elite, incendiary, all the cavalry upgrades, and then the range are so good. They're much faster, they still do fantastic damage, they can even kill bombards, they can kill mangonels, they can kill knights, they're insane. Streltsy, we'll see how OP they are once we are not making a horse archer, because they are like literally free. 80 food, 40 wood, 
Here's how I think horse archers should be changed. First of all, fix their attack speed. That will already show us much about how good they actually are when they attack slower. I think it's appropriate. Uh, and if that is not enough, or if we think that's not going to be enough, add a 10 gold cost to the horse archer. Just 10. Doesn't have to be 20 or 30 or 40. Just add 10. And maybe they will even need to gather some gold from a mining camp with their villagers when they go five archery range horse archers after fast castle with warrior monks everywhere just 10. for the rest i think Rus is fine they're very powerful they have the longest range spring ult still they get many of the things that other ships have they have sposkaya tower which is a a troubleshooting landmark like oh i'm in trouble let's let's build a strong keep if they don't need that, they definitely are going to go for the high armory. Golden Gate, does it need nerf? I think Golden Gate needs one thing. Not allowed to buy stone is what I think Golden Gate needs. The fact that they don't need to gather stone but can still expand anytime they feel like it. Just by spending 200 gold, they get 300 stone. It costs 520 gold for other sifts to buy 300 stone. 520, it costs them 200. And the fact that there's no natural correlation between scouting and then reacting, it's like, oh, my opponent is gathering stone. He's going to expand. Or maybe they have a marketplace and you won't see it coming, but at least it costs them 520 gold. But for Roos, you see nothing. You see Golden Gate, you're like, oh, he's getting lots of wood. Maybe he's selling it to buy gold. So he's going to go fast castle. Then suddenly they're like, ticket, ticket, 300 stone, boom, fast expand, second town center. Either you're not allowed to buy stone, or when you buy it, it should cost 200 gold, not 100, to get 150 stone. That way, 300 stone would cost Rus 400 gold. Still cheaper than 520, buy 120. So you're essentially getting 120 resources out of that, which is still more than the 50 that you get out of a single transaction in other resources for a total of 100 in other resources for two tickets. So if it costed 200 gold to buy 150 stone, that would still be 20% cheaper than the transaction that you get in other resources. But right now, because the relation between the more expensive stone in standard marketplaces is not remembered, Buying stone is the best thing in the game for the Rus via the Golden Gate. So, uh, yeah, that's my suggestion for Golden Gate. I think it's an important suggestion to follow because it feels way too good. Like, I could be Rus, I could be planning to go Imperial, and then I see the situation, and I have four tickets on my Golden Gate, and I just, I have a thousand lumber. I'm like, I buy 600 stone, uh, and now I'm going to get... Uh, now I'm gonna get two town centers. It's so easy and suddenly you've you've got like an amazing economy uh, set up. Is Roos gonna be weak if they have more expensive stone? It's not gonna affect their one base horse archer play. Horse archer normalization of attack speed is still gonna allow Roos to go early nights. They still have the normal archers and spearmen that others have. They still have the bounty mechanic. They still have an easy way to go scouts and get uh, professional scouts dear to their town center they still have strong cavalry the longest range springles they still have the best hand cannons in streltsy horse archers will still be good for harass uh, you just can't moss them as much as now um, they still have free generation from hunting cabins overall they'll still be a strong civilization and uh, yeah i think they'll still be played uh, quite a lot for their playstyle and strength they're just overperforming because of these baboon tactics with I'm only going to make horse archers into everything. And that is my breakdown. 48 civilizations, how I think the game should be rebalanced. Next, a point on the maps. Maps, of, of, of course, heavily influence uh, the balance of a game as well. We've got 14 maps right now. I'd love to see some new maps coming in. Maybe an actual ranked mode where you can also have perhaps vetoes. I think that could be nice. Um, let's talk about what maps I think are good and balanced in general for the most part. I think mountain 
pass needs some changes with not all relics spawning on one side maybe a few more openings in the mountains standard and then i think it'll be a good map lippy needs a good map uh high view is a pretty good map as far as hybrid maps goes if it was more balanced i think ancient spires is a fantastic map danube river is fine black forest is interesting but it needs its sacred sites back it's especially important on a map like this where turtling is very popular Mongolian Heights is actually a really fun map, especially if Mongols get rebalanced, where they are not the only choice anymore together with Delhi. Altai, I think, is a good map. Apparently, it's quite good for English, which is fine. Everyone is allowed to have some better sifs, uh, better maps per sif. But I think Altai is a pretty good map. Confluence, a little bit too campy for my taste. Here's my suggestion for Confluence. Make the river only go till here, till here, till here, and till here. Have the outskirts of the map walkable without being affected by every warship that is camping it once you lose uh, water control. Uh, French Pass, Hill and Dale, I think, are fine to exist. King of the Hill is quite imbalanced. I think on King of the Hill, make sure that there's a little bit more wood, I would say. At least always have some wood in the corner back of your base. As it stands, sometimes you've got it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't have it, they do. It's mostly an RNG rebalancing, a bit more consistency. Some people are never going to like water maps. I'll play them. Just want more sifts to be playable on them. Not much to say about uh, changing them, in my opinion. Nagari, just more symmetry is required, in my opinion. Uh, and Boulder Bay, yeah. It's, it's a different beast. Not much to say about it. Would like to see some new maps that are more average, averagely balanced that are similar to Lipany and Altai. Especially Lipany. I think Lipany is the best map in the game. Uh, the Twisted Meadows or the Lost Temple of uh, Age of Empires 4. The Dry Arabia from Age of Empires 2. Lipany, I think it's the golden standard. And that's my balance patch suggestions. We can also revisit this and compare it to the actual next patch when we get it from Relic. We can see what's similar, what's different, what's missing, what's good. Hope you enjoyed. Now let me know your thoughts in Twitch chat or in the comments below the video player. Peace.